any port to another switch not determined as a root or designated port is set to block the forwarding of frames. So those, those become blocked ports. Uh, the port isn't disabled, it just isn't set to forward frames on. Um, and then block ports still receive BPDUs. And the key thing to remember is this is only ports to other switches because the first thing that comes up in my mind without that is, well, if it's set not to forward frames, how do you know how do the frames get to any endpoint devices? This only applies to ports connected to other switches. It does not apply to ports connected to um, you know, set up as access ports to, to individual uh, PCs and printers and that kind of thing. Um, port state transitions. STP is set to react to topology changes um, if, if they happen to occur. It has transition states set up to avoid switching loops in the event of a change. Um, two intermediate states occur before forwarding is allowed. So um, what disabled is kind of a, a sub-function. Uh, disabled basically the interface is administrative shutdown or inoperable as a result of the security violation. It doesn't participate in this at all. It's set to disabled, so it's not doing anything. Um, let's see, for, for blocking, um, blocking does not forward any user data. All ports start out in this state. Uh, it does not send, but can still receive BPDUs to react to topology changes. And uh, the, the transition time is anywhere from 0 to 20 seconds. Um, 20 seconds being basically if it uh, comes up as, as dead on the other side. It doesn't forward any user data. Remember, this is only applying to um, ports connected to other switches. So that's that's the reason it, it's not worried about forwarding user data because it's not going to be connected. It's not going to be um, connected to any endpoint there. Um, so between blocking and forwarding, you've got the listening and learning states. And whenever we talk about rapid spanning tree, this is kind of um, kind of looked at as like the Achilles heel and speed of um, of STP. So you got to, before you can forward frames, you've got these two 15 second transitions of listening and learning. When you get to listening, it begins to transition to a forwarding state by listening and sending BPUs, but no other data is sent. Uh, learning is basically in the same kind of situation, but it starts to actually uh, build its MAC address table from, uh, you know, the, the interface is directly connected, but still at that point, no user data is sent. If it gets through, you know, both this 30 second period, everything looks like it's good at that point it's finally in a forwarding state where it can start sending things along um, you know but before that this is basically to prevent that the routing loop from potentially occurring or a switching loop from potentially occurring before it gets to the forwarding state so it may take up to 20 seconds for it to determine a change has occurred um, because that is the that's the dead timer for neighbors I was saying before um, if it misses 10 two second BPDUs a total of 20 seconds this is the max age timer um, th that's the the 20 seconds is kind of worst case scenario if a link goes down immediately it's going to know that the link is down um, this is really more of a situation where it, it believes the link is up it, it still looks like the link is up but for whatever reason that neighbor switch is not is um, is got something internal malfunctioning where the port's still up and so it's it's unable to send those BPDUs as a result. So after you know it misses ten of those, it's going to finally realize that okay, even though I see this this link is up physically um, and logically, I know that the the switch on that other side is having some kind of problem because I'm not getting the BPDUs from it. So I'm going to consider that a, a dead uh, a dead link. Uh, when a change occurs, a non-root bridge sends a specific BPDU called the topology change uh, a topology change notification TCN back to the root bridge. So, um, you know, if a link goes down, a switch is going to see that that link went down and immediately send this, this TCN back to the root bridge to let it know that a change has occurred. Uh, if, if it doesn't see a link go directly down, but the, the switch connected to it is having some kind of problem and finally uh, times out, after 20 seconds, it's finally going to send the TCN. So that's, that's basically the two situations for how long it's going to take for that, that notification to go out. When the root bridge receives that TCN, it sends it out a special BPDU to all switches that tells them to age out any CAM entries. Uh, so basically clears the MAC tables. Um, switches begin, you know, basically clear those CAM tables and then begin rebuilding the CAM tables. Uh, listening and learning states have a default of 15 seconds, but can be lower for smaller networks. Um, an STP topology change could take up to 50 seconds total if you think about 
You know, you've got your possible 20 seconds if it's not, if you have to go through the dead timers. And then you've got an, another 15 seconds of listening and 15 seconds of learning. So potentially you could be down for 15 seconds, 50 seconds total, which uh, in, in networking time can seem like an eternity. Um, timers are based on a, a network diameter. Um, so that's the number of switches between two hosts of seven. If your network has a smaller diameter, you can modify the configuration of the root bridge. A, a, the diameter is basically the, um, basically the, the switch on the furthest, the two switches furthest from each other in it, a switch network is basically your diameter. If you've got, um, you know, your three hops from a switch till it gets to the root bridge and then another three hops from that root bridge till it gets to the other hop, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have a diameter of six. So if you've got less than a diameter of seven, you can set these values lower, but that, that's kind of a, a bit of tweaking. Once we get into rabbit spanning tree, you won't really have to worry about um, doing this more than likely because we're going to have some, some things that come into play that, that really take down those timers uh, considerably without having to mess with uh, diameter differences. Um, oops. Okay, sorry, kind of clicked it. Okay, so um, initial switch configuration. Um, switches have a, a default configuration that allows for plug and play in any like single switch environments. Um, and, and so like most of the time, like if you're, especially if you're just a single site deployment where you're not gonna have a network of interconnected switches, you can pretty much usually just plug a switch directly into a router and you should have some kind of basic functionality so that you can get things going. Um, the majority of basic switch configurations are identical to routers on Cisco's. Um, so anything like your host name, your login banner, passwords, uh, telnet and SSH access, etc. All that stuff, the, the configuration commands are going to be identical to what we already talked about with respect to routers. Um, some specific configurations for switches are still required though. Um, so one of those is assigning a management IP and a, a default gateway. So since a, a switch is a layer two device, if you ever wanted to try to telnet into that switch or um, you know, basically access it any method other than console to make changes, you're not gonna be able to telnet into it at layer three because it doesn't have an IP address. That's what a management IP is for. It's basically setting a, an IP address that's used just so you can access that switch if you need to make configuration changes or, or look closer inside the switch, that kind of thing. So. Switches need that layer three address for management. Um, the default gateway is the IP of the router it connects to for the interface. Um, so switch uh, from global configuration mode and just like router to get to there, it's just uh, enable mode, get into enable mode and then config terminal. Um, interface VLAN one, IP address, I 172.16.1.100 space and then your subnet mask 255.255.0.0 jump out of uh, interface configuration mode back to global configuration mode and IP default dash gateway 172.16.1.1 and then uh, no shutdown so that's uh, that's actually assigning just the, the management IP and the, the default gateway uh, and then you can also use IP assignment using DHCP. Um, the IP for VLAN 1 can also be determined by DHCP if the attached router is uh, appropriately configured for DHCP on the LAN. Um, if that's the case, uh, you know, from switch interface VLAN 1, uh, IP address DHCP, and then no shutdown. And then presumably the router, if appropriately configured, is going to give the, the switch the, the correct IP address as well as the, the default gateway. Uh, the DHCP lease can be verified with the, the show DHCP lease command. That's going to show you all the different um, MAC addresses with IPs and how long they've been there, how, long, how much longer until the DHCP lease expires and they've got to re-up that lease or get another IP.